Let's go ahead and get started. Um, one announcement before um, Dr. Malahan gets started. I'm working on scheduling the last Journal Club of the Year, which historically we've had Genentech sponsor. I think you probably saw my email yesterday. And so the responses I've gotten back from most people is, we'll self-fund it and we won't have an invited speaker. I think it'll be more enjoyable that way. I'm thinking of having a faculty club on upper campus. And hopefully, you won't have to kick in any money. Somehow, I'll come up with paying for the whole evening. It's not terribly expensive to rent a faculty club and have a, a modest meal. So. Uh, it won't be May 26th, though, the day that's on the calendar. That doesn't work for Bill. He's out of town. It's going to be later in June, somewhere between the 15th and the 22nd. Oh, wow. So I'll send you more emails about that. Trixie said to remind people about the stamp, too. Oh, uh, if you park, anybody park underneath today? Are you supposed to stamp your ticket? I never figured out how this system works. <laughs> 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 You have to do it on the way out instead of on and the way stop, in. And they, then stop at the front, on your yeah, way stop out. Stop at the front desk, yeah, by the elevators. Okay. Uh, so I invited uh, Dr. Michael Malahan to be our speaker today um, because he's my audiologist, and I was uh, tremendously impressed. He's the uh, director of the Hearing and Balance Lab up in Mill Creek. Mill Creek happens to be the word of the day for CME credit today. And I realized after a number of visits there, if the rest of you know as little about audiology and balance and tinnitus and vertigo as I do, that this would be very pragmatic and helpful. I know when I'm interviewing somebody and they don't hear well, my response is to yell at them. <laughs> so, um, so, all the time anyway. <laughs> So, I mean, not only is he the director of that lab, a big group of audiologists, but he teaches doctoral students here at the university in their audiology program. And perhaps most impressively, twice a year, he leads a group down to Guatemala to give um, essentially free health care to indigent young kids down there who otherwise would probably wind up uh, with profound hearing loss if they didn't get free health care. So thanks for coming down today. And um, I'm sure we'll learn quite a bit. Thank you very much. I'm excited to hear about what I'm going to talk about here. <laughs> uh, first of all, no disclosures. Other than I am a lifelong Seattle Sounders fan. Yay. More than 40 years. Uh, happily, we survived Portland on Sunday. I look forward to a, uh, a great year. I'm also a Liverpool fan, so if you're a Chelsea fan, you can leave the room now. Um, I run a soccer program for kids, kindergarten through high school. I still referee soccer. Uh, luckily for my team, I've quit playing as a player. But uh, soccer is my, uh, my allocation here. So let's see if we can move along. Uh, what? That's not working, so I'm going to the wrong direction. Okay, background. Uh, grew up in this area, uh, schooling uh, Arizona School of Health Sciences. I joined the uh, otolaryngology practice back in 1982 with Pat Lynch, who was a phenomenal mentor. Uh, Dr. McBride may remember Dr. Lynch from the past. Uh, great, great guy. Uh, established the Hearing and Balance Lab in 1994. Uh, I've been teaching at the University of Washington Medical Audiology for second year doctoral students. Uh, I enjoy that a lot. Uh, they really make me work hard. Uh, I'm proud that uh, I was able to, uh, due to a lot of reticence from the medical, from the hospitals, uh, able to establish a newborn hearing screening program well before it was uh, started within the state. Uh, hearing loss is the number one birth defect, and uh, we I got tired of seeing children at one to two years of age that were that we're hearing impaired and we lose so much in the first two years and if you don't get it, you're, you actually are lost for life. Uh, no matter what happens further on, you have a, you have a huge consequence um, growing up with, uh, with hearing loss. As Dr. Altman mentioned, I've been leading medical teams in Guatemala for the last 12 years. If you have any interest in serving, uh, I've got a fun opportunity for you. 
Uh, I'll be taking some university students at the end of August uh, and starting a curriculum teaching Guatemalans how to do diagnostic testing and fit hearing aids. We have three clinics established with Guatemalans now that can do everything. They can do the evaluations, they have hearing aids to fit on children, and they can uh, do all the follow-up care. So it's, a, it's an exciting uh, part to group to be a part of. The mouse is quick working. So what's an audiologist? Uh, audiologist has uh, a doctoral level uh, education in audiology. You come from an undergraduate program, hopefully in, in uh, some science, but audiologists come with a, a care and uh, desire to, to help. There's a lot of altruism as there is in, in all health professions. We, we see, and in my practice, we see newborn infants to adults for hearing imbalance related problems. Uh, there are 12,000 throughout the United States, and they work in different uh, conditions. They work in a clinical practice, such as I do. They work in research. Uh, there's a fantastic lab at the University of Washington, the Bodell Lab uh, with Ed Rubel, uh, group over there, and Dr. Hume's group working on research. There are audiologists who work in industry. The Boeing Company has some noise, and audiologists work in overseeing hearing conservation programs and ensuring that workers uh, do not lose their hearing as a result of their, their employment. There's also audiologists in schools that serve children that have hearing loss and making sure that they have access to all the technology that they need to successfully uh, proceed through uh, academic uh, adventures. As I mentioned, hearing loss is the number one birth defect. There are six per thousand infants born uh, that have an educationally significant hearing loss. One per thousand infants are born deaf for all kinds of different reasons. Half of them <laughs> come from special care nursery, and that's where we started screening infants. But the other half come from the normal group. So I have no idea why they, they end up the way they do. So we now screen every child the day they're born. We, can, we have an ability to do a test and determine if they have normal hearing or not. If they don't, then we can do other diagnostic testing to identify the degree and severity and get them help and assistance uh, right away. Interestingly enough, because of the advent of newborn screening and early identification and the growth in technology with cochlear implants, uh, there are the sign language is going to become less and less and less a part of the American culture. Uh, there are about 15% of children that, that cochlear implants do not work with. Brainstem implants are coming along, but uh, there, is, uh, there are less and less deaf kids now walking in the kindergarten. And if a child's identified at birth with a hearing loss, you cannot tell the difference between them and their normal hearing kindergarten classmates. Their speech and language is going to be clear. And they're going to have full access to sound, which is a phenomenal thing. Uh, the bad news is you get a hearing loss as you, as you age. Uh, you get hearing loss from all kinds of different reasons. Uh, your past sense from rock and roll do come up to catch up with you in the, uh, in the future. So uh, for the younger crowd, it may be important to consider uh, protection. Uh, the other thing is that we see patients with balance disorders. And uh, we see a lot of uh, balance patients. Dizziness is, uh, is a very common problem among adults, pretty rare among children. We do see pediatric cases for balance assessment, but they're usually uh, multifactorial issues with children and balance issues. Adults, some of it is very self-limiting, some are life-changing and altering, and, and actually some intervention can make a huge difference in their, in their lives. <clears throat> We're going to do some basic anatomy and physiology with you just to re recall your past medical education. We break the ear up as audiologists and laryngologists into three parts. We have the outer, the middle, and the inner ear. And the outer ear has uh, two glands, the sebaceous and ceruminous glands. They secrete an oily substance. Epithelial layer is sloughed off from the eardrum on out. Hits the, the oily substance, creates cerumen. And the ear canal grows in a spiral fashion. So it rejects out all cerumen out of the ear, unless humans intervene. 
by using Q-tips or bobby pins or paper clips or whatnot, and they can, they love to, to clean their ears, and Johnson & Johnson's done a great job of telling us we need to clean our ears. When in fact, we don't. Only about 10% of the population needs help uh, by getting their ears uh, cleaned. Interestingly enough, um, in the uh, indigenous populations, there's a there's an overproduction of cerumen, and there's also dry cerumen that adheres to the canal like a scab and then builds up and builds up and builds up. So in my time in Guatemala, a large amount of my time is spent cleaning kids' ears. It happens uh, to the Aztecs, the Incas, all the way to the Aleuts. It's a very common thing to have outer ear canal impactions. Also, some of the heritage causes some middle ear problems. The middle ear is comprised of the eardrum, which has three layers of skin. Uh, and most parts, and one part has two layers of skin. The middle ear space, which you folks have uh, an interest in in some respects, is lined with a mucous membrane going down to the back of the throat and eustachian tube. Within that space are three small bones, and they're all attached. The inner ear is comprised of two mechanisms. Of particular interest to me is the inner ear, the cochlea, and the vestibular system. I'll talk about both. Eustachian tube is oriented in a vertical fashion as you're an adult, as a child is more horizontally oriented. And it doesn't open up as freely for children as it does for adults. And therefore, any inflammatory issues that come into play cause the eustachian to become inflamed and doesn't allow it to open up and provide an exchange of oxygen. As adults, it becomes less and less of a problem. Here's a normal cochlea uh, with the supporting hair cell structures and the hair cells lining the that snail-like shell goes up two and a half turns. Underneath of the hair cells themselves are uh, attachments, neurons that then combine into essentially electrical wiring. Here's the wiring that goes into a nerve bundle that heads on up to the, the auditory cortex, typically the left temporal lobe. What goes wrong with this system? As they talked about some of the things in the outer ear canal, there can be, during, the, during pregnancy, you can have a malformation. Uh, in the seventh week uh, gestation, the ear forms, the, the, the otolith forms, the balance system forms, or the vestibular system is formed very early in development. You can have uh, malformations of the outer ear, you end up with, with no lobe, or you end up with no canal. The middle and that inner ear may be perfectly formed, but you have a blockage heading from the outer to the middle ear. The middle ear, as I said, is lined with a mucous membrane, and that mucous membrane can become inflamed. The eustachian tube is opening up about <coughs> 300 times a day. It opens up a little bit, a little bit all day long, and ventilates the system because the surrounding tissue in there is constantly absorbing the oxygen that's in that space. If it's not replenished, it gets into trouble. When the eustachian tube gets inflamed, it, it closes off. All the oxygen that's in that space gets absorbed, creates negative pressure. You get an earache. After a short period of time, that negative pressure actually pulls fluid from the surrounding tissue and fills up with fluid. Serous fluid fills up the space, and if there's any bacteria in the neighborhood, it then, then becomes infected. So you can have serous fluid in there that is filling the space, causes a temporary impact to the hearing, doesn't hurt, feels fine, kid doesn't complain anymore because the earache is gone, kid walks around with no complaints, however they have a mild hearing loss. And that mild hearing loss can last for two weeks to two months. Without intervention, it typically resolves on its own. Sometimes it uh, becomes infected and then it gets into trouble. That infection, that bacterial infection can invade the mastoid air cells and cause trouble and become mastoiditis. The, infl the chronic inflammation can cause scarring of the tissue and then you become, then you have, then you're more prone to middle ear problems down the road. What you're going to see in your practice is looking in a kid's ear, if it's free and clear, you'll see an amber hue rather than a nice pearly gray appearance to the TM. If you see an amber hue, that is consistent with serous fluid behind the eardrum. If you can get the kid to sit still long enough, you can make a decision, should I refer them on or, or not? 
Typically, this is a very temporary condition and it will resolve in three weeks to two months. If you see this child routinely and they have fluid chronically, then I would get concerned, especially in a young child. If they're full of fluid and for a long period of time, they have a high opportunity for delay in speech and language acquisition. If their speech and language is normal, it's not that big a deal. It's going to resolve typically on its own. A child is going to have two to three uh, incidents of middle ear issues in the first two to three years of life, and they'll, they should survive just fine. If it's a chronic problem and they have a delay in speech and language development, the next step is, is to put a tube in the ear. The PE tube is inserted into the eardrum after an opening, suction out a bit of the fluid out of the ear. The PE tube now becomes the eustachian tube, ventilates the ear, dries it out, and allows return of normal hearing function. A child walking out of surgery is going to have pretty much normal hearing when they walk out after the PE tube. Within the middle ear, you can get all kinds of problems. The bones can have a hereditary type of problem called otosclerosis. Uh, cementing down an otospongiosis around the stapes foot plate can stiffen up the foot plate and not allow it to move as freely. That then solidifies and causes a significant conductive hearing loss. That can be corrected surgically by going in, removing that stapes, and putting in an artificial uh, stapes. It works quite well. Chronic middle ear problems also cause perforation of the eardrums. You can have a big whopping hole in the eardrum, and amazingly enough, not have any hearing loss. You have all kinds of really bad looking eardrums, and you think, man, you're going to have a lot of hearing loss. They have perfectly normal hearing. It's pretty amazing how the, how the system actually works. Yes, Dr. McBride. How are the bones connected in the middle ear? I've always wondered, is there a synovial joint there, or what kind of joint does the ear You're asking an oligology question of an audiologist, but it is, uh, there, is, uh, there is a cartilaginous uh, attachment, is my understanding. Oligologists may argue differently, but that's my understanding. The inner ear, the cochlea, is the area that is commonly injured from all kinds of different things medications, uh, aminoglycosides, uh, chemotherapy agents, particularly cisplatin, will cause damage to the cochlea of the hair cells themselves. Rock and roll can cause damage to those hair cells themselves. Working in Boeing for 40 years causes damage to those hair cells if you're not properly protected. Uh, different types of inflammatory issues, uh, viruses cause impact and damage the, the cochlear hair cells. So, how do we check this thing out? How do we evaluate the system? We have all kinds of different tools, and over the last 20 years of practice, the tools that I have at my disposal have become a lot better. I'm able to identify problems uh, that I've not been able to see before, both in the hearing and the balance side of things. So we use simple, we can use tests that we've done for a long period of time. Tympanometry is just a functional measurement of how the eardrum is moving. We put pressure against the eardrum, we put in a low frequency tone, we push the eardrum in, we pull it out and measure how well sound goes through the system. If the ear is full of fluid, the eardrum's not going to move well, we're going to get a flat line. If we get a normal response, we get a nice peak response measured about zero decapascals, it tells me the pressure outside is equal to pressure inside. If there's some inflammatory issues going on and there's some negative pressure in there, I'm going to get a negative peak and it's going to peak off the side. So tympanometry tells me about, number one, is the eardrum is, in, is it intact? You could have a micro perf, and you can't see it, but the tympanometry is going to tell me I've got a large volume, that tells me there's a hole in the eardrum. Sometimes you look at an eardrum and you say, man, there's a big whopping hole there, but in fact, it's a replacement membrane, and it's only two layers of tissue, and it looks like there's a hole when in fact, there's a membrane over that space, and pneumotoscopy can allow you to see that if you have that ability. Tympanometry is going to tell me I have a normal volume and not, in fact, a hole. So tympanometry tells me about middle ear condition. Otoacoustic emissions. Amazingly enough, when sound goes into your ear and it hits the cochlea, the hair cells fire a signal to the brain. It actually fires a signal back out of your ear. So whatever goes in actually comes back out of your ear as a generated signal. I put in a 5,000 hertz tone, a 5,000 hertz comb comes back out of your ear. And it's the cochlea making that measure. 
That's a beautiful thing that we were able to discover back in 1976 and finally came into commercial practice. Uh, we were able to start doing newborn screening. So we can tell in 30 seconds, is the hearing normal or not by doing an acoustic emission? And it's a frequency specific measure. So it tells us about low frequency information, which are vowel sounds, on up to high frequencies, which are consonant sounds, and can identify where the problem is, whether it's normal or not. It doesn't tell us how not normal. So you can have a mild loss and fail. You can be deaf and have the same result. It just tells us, are things perfectly normal or not normal? Or how much is, is there a loss in the high end or a loss in the low end? It's a really cool instrumentation. It only costs $17,000, so I can help you get some of those in your office to do quick checks. It is kind of silly expensive, and obviously we get paid very little for it, but it's an important measure for us to do. Middle ear muscle reflexes is a check of the wiring, essentially. It's a, it's a check of the uh, sound goes up to the brain. At the, at the brain stem, it says, hey, that's too loud, and sends a signal back to the middle ear to cause a muscle contraction, which stiff, stiffens up the ossicles and tightens them up and dampens down some of the sound coming into the ear. Amazingly enough, just before we start to talk, both muscles binaurally contract and dampen down our voice in our head so we don't sound loud to ourselves. But it also has some protective mechanism when loud sound is coming into the ear. But also is a test of the wiring. We put a loud sound in the ear, we measure where the muscle contraction occurs, at what loudness level. If you have an acoustic neuroma, a vestibular schwannoma growing on the auditory nerve, you're going to have an absent, uh, absent reflex. Um, it's also a check. Uh, Interestingly enough, and I'll talk about it more, is, it, is a patient a good, pa a good candidate for amplification for hearing aids? If they don't have a middle ear muscle reflex, then they're going to not be as likely to benefit greatly from amplification as somebody with a good middle ear muscle reflex. Audit audiometry. Thing you all know about, raise your hand when you hear the tone. Fire a button when you hear the tone. It's a pure tone measure just to get a ballpark idea of what the hearing is like. We also do speech testing. Repeat back words in quiet, repeat back words with four other people talking in the background and see how you perform. If you have a vestibular schwannoma, you're going to re perform very poorly on speech and noise. You'll be perfectly normal in speech and quiet. So we, all kind, we do all kinds of different speech testing on, on children and adults to find out their, their functional performance. The other thing is, you may have a perfectly normal peripheral mechanism. <laughs> But all the wires don't go upstairs. So in the auditory cortex, there may be some organizational problems. There may be some desynchrony and firing up there. So you have a perfectly normal uh, peripheral uh, auditory function. You can't hear when, there's, uh, when the sound gets up there. You can hear in quiet, but you add noise in the background, a complex simulation, child can't hear. So a child goes into kindergarten, they pass the hearing screening at the hospital, they pass the hearing screening in kindergarten. They don't do well in school. They're sitting in the classroom. They have, they have difficulty in a classroom situation. The teacher says, OK, go to your desk, open up your spelling book, and um, get ready to go. The child's still standing at the coat closet, not knowing what the, what the second and third steps of the process is. That's an auditory processing problem. It also occurs when you get older. Uh, you're, you, if you, if you, as we get older, we can't defrag the hard drive upstairs, so our processor slows down, and we get some auditory processing deficits, deficits as we get older. So our processor, our ability to process complex speech uh, becomes less accurate. So speech and noise, everybody complains about difficulty hearing and noise. I have all kinds of 30-somethings coming to my office complaining about big problems with their hearing, when in fact it's an auditory processing problem. And it's going to become more challenging when you get into a stressful environment, a lot of noise, or your fatigue. Brainstem auditory vocal responses is a, a, a picking up of electrodes, the sound processed up to the auditory cortex. So we can look at way stations along the way from the cochlea up to, from the brainstem up to the auditory cortex. We can do this testing by frequency specific. So we can test an infant and find out how much hearing loss they have and where it is and be able to help decide on cochlear implantation or hearing aids and how to program those hearing aids appropriately.
But which is the technique to use in a newborn to know right away at birth that they hear? We use two. We use two things in special care nursery. Kids have a uh, higher opportunity for this audi uh, <clears throat> this auditory dyssynchrony, this processor problem. So we use the bear, the brainstem auditory vocal response test. That'll tell us if they have a if they have a wiring problem upstairs. Otoacoustic emissions is commonly used in, in screening uh, in, this, in the regular uh, population. So if you didn't spend any time in special care nursery, we're gonna do a bear and an OAE. Typical screening, we'll do an OAE. Many facilities use bear on every single kid. It's dramatically more expensive and you're gonna find one per 100,000 children with an auditory processing problem but you get paid more for doing the bear. <laughs> and there's a company that's developed that does very well at doing that in hospitals. Yes. What does it mean when you fail an OEE but pass a bear? Oh, that I saw quite, quite not infrequently, but just occasionally. So a bear is a, depends on what kind of bear it is. A bear, a screening bear, yeah, finds screen out screen if screen it's, bear. you're gonna find out if you have a mild loss or better. So you're only gonna to go to a certain level on a bear. If you're doing a diagnostic bear, you're gonna go all the way to threshold and find out if there's any problem at all. So a screening bear in the hospital is a quick screen, finds out if you have a mild loss. If you have a, you can't fail the OAE and pass the bear because there's a gap between those two measures. Okay, I talked about some of the common causes of hearing loss that occur. As we get older, things kind of wear out a bit, and it happens in the, both in the auditory cortex and also in the cochlea. Um, we see a lot of patients that end up with, uh, particularly um, um, from motor vehicle accidents, they suffer uh, traumas and, and also injure the cochlea. Cochlea is housed in the temporal bone, which is the thickest bone and in the safest area. The vestibular system is also contained in there, so it's very well protected. So you got to have a really big walk to the head to get, to get a fracture in that area. Here's the other thing we're finding out is, as, we, as you get hearing loss, <clears throat> The auditory cortex says, hey, there's nothing showing up up here. The peripheral, the cochlea is not sending data. So your ear now becomes a filter. Rather than a transducer of sound from outside to inside, it filters that sound by hair cell damage and, and filters out the high frequency signals most commonly. Well, that's where the clarity of speech is. Vowel sounds are, are loud and powerful. They give the power to speech, consonants, provide the clarity to speech. When you lose the consonant sounds, your wife mumbles. When you lose the consonant sounds, the person with that, with that accent is a lot tougher to follow. Women and children are more difficult to, to understand when you have a high frequency hearing loss. It's not that we're not paying attention most of the time. It's not we can't hear you. Interestingly enough, when you stop supplying data upstairs, the brain starts looking for other things to do. And therefore, it can cause a, a two, uh, an increase in the functional activity there, and it creates a signal called tinnitus. It also um, causes a change in brain size. So we look at... Um, People with hearing loss and brain volume over time. And what we've discovered is that when you have a significant hearing loss, your brain shrinks. So what we do know is if you exercise the ears, there's evidence that says that things still stay together longer. So physical therapy for your ears is now commonly available and provided. So not only on top of hearing aid amplification, there's auditory training that occurs to, to pump things up for your brain. So when you talk about technology, there's all kinds of surgeries that can be done that can, that can pretty much take care of the problem, but sometimes it doesn't take care of all the problem, and once you get damaged to the cochlea, you can't repair that. So you need some help, you need some assistance. 
Hearing aid technology has made dramatic improvements in the last five years even. I wear hearing aids myself and the ability for the hearing aids to function uh, provides amazing things. I still have a hell of a time in a cocktail party, but I have less of a hell of a time in a cocktail party nowadays with the technology. Computer processing and small chip design allows algorithms that can suppress some noise that is not speech noise and amplify speech and make it clearer in many conditions. So hearing aids make a huge difference. So there's, uh, there's now the iPhone hearing aid. There's a hearing aid that you wear that you can adjust the, the performance based on your phone. You can turn your phone into a remote microphone. So if you have difficulty hearing your, your colleague across the dinner table, you sit the phone right by them and, you, and it goes right to your hearing aids. You can listen to the Mariners game and nobody knows you're listening. <laughs> You can uh, find that, boy, this setting and this situation really works well for me. I hear really well. You pin that spot, and every time you return to that spot, your hearing aid program changes to that where it did the best. It's a pretty, uh, pretty amazing technology. We also have a device called Lyric. It's been around for more than five years, and it's an extended wear hearing aid, like the extended wear contact. We insert it into the ear canal. It stays in the ear three to four months, hopefully, sometimes less. And you don't forget about it. You can sleep with it. You can shower with it. You can do anything with it. It works amazingly well. It also does something that regular hearing aids can't do. It puts this the pickup microphone deep in the ear. My microphone is right here on the top of my ear. So I get the, with the Lyric device, it takes the information and, and the, the concha bowl direct sound into this microphone. So it's also in a very small place. It's fit four millimeters from the TM. So the speaker amplifies in a very small area, doesn't require a lot of energy, and that's why the battery lasts so long. My hearing aid batteries last me a week. With the Lyric, it lasts anywhere from two to four months. The device is inserted within the inner th the third of the ear canal, so any serum that accumulates is usually in the outer third of the ear canal, so it doesn't become a problem commonly. <clears throat> it's, a very, uh, it's a very good thing for, for all kinds of people. I have a 16-year-old high school student that has worn behind-the-ear hearing aids for a long time. She's very active in sports, and as a volleyball player, her hearing aids kept falling out when she was playing. Where in the Lyric, she has no problems with that at all. Uh, you can actually go swimming with the device if you use a swim band. There's an example of a cochlear implant, and that has changed dramatically over the years. Um, there are some other connectivity issues with cochlear implants. You can plug into your cell phone, you can plug into music. Um, it has all kinds of functionality with the cochlear implant. People that lose their hearing as an adult, cochlear implant's an amazing benefit that was not there previously. Um, so those are some of the examples of, of technology and that works quite well. What's How do you spell Lyric? Sorry. Lyric is L-Y-R-I-C. Not to be confused with Lyrica, the medication. What's the cost? Depends on what you want to pay. <laughs> well, no. for the Lyrica, or no, Lyric. I'm just kidding. No, the Lyric device is a, a subscription-based plan. So you, it's $3,500 per year for both ears. So $1,750 per, per ear. No. We have folks, I have a guy that flies down from Ketchikan, Alaska every three months for this device replacement. People live in eastern Washington, out on the coast. They come from all over for this technology. They love it, it. There's a lot of... And who inserts it? Is it the ENT or is it nope. the audiologist? No. Audiologists insert the device. Yeah. Do any insurances pay for that? Yes. Yeah. Insurance, depending on the insurance, and as we know, insurance pays for less and less. There are benefits in, in insurance that do pay for hearing aids and pays for Lyric also. Yeah. That's the one that I have. And there's no comparison with more traditional hearing aids. It's just an amazing device. The sound quality is more natural, more normal than, than other technology. It's got a richer sound quality. It gives stereo hearing because of the location of the device. Um, it, there is some evidence that it 
view better with speech and noise. But speech and noise is really tough with, uh, with any hearing loss. <clears throat> is there any part of that that shows externally, or is that all it with No, you cannot, <clears throat> you cannot see the device. It's, it is deep, deep, deep in the air. <clears throat> Tinnitus. Speak a little lyric. 85% of, of lyric patients don't hear their tinnitus, which is, a, which is another benefit. Tinnitus is a perception of a sound in the ear. It can be a roaring, a humming, a buzz, a whistle, a whine, a ring. Rarely is it 80s music. It comes on for all kinds of different reasons. And it can start in the cochlea with damage to the hair cells, but it always ends up in the brain. When, when tinnitus begins, it could begin in the brain or it could be begin in the cochlea. But after a period of time, it burns itself into the hard drive memory. And even though the, 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 the cause of the tinnitus in the cochlea goes away, the tinnitus stays in the brain. It's like a phantom limb pain. It's a, it's a phantom sound that persists and likely will persist and be your good friend for the rest of your life. It happens in 15% of the population. Very, very common phenomenon that occurs. It can occur from a high fever illness. It can occur from a lot of different medications. It can occur from a blunt force trauma. It can occur from listening to much, too much ACDC. It's, uh, it you, typically can be initially a temporary phenomenon when you have a noise exposure kind of like a canary in the mine, when you walk out of the Dave Matthews concert and you've been sitting too close to the speaker, you walk out and your ears feel a little plugged up and you hear a ringing in your ears. If you're lucky, the next day it's gone and all you have is a hangover. But what can very well happen is that the tinnitus comes on and stays on and doesn't go away. For 80% of the population, um, Educate them, educating the patient about tinnitus is, is the solution. Rarely, tinnitus is caused by an acoustic neuroma or a vestibular schwannoma. So people get all, all concerned if they have uh, tinnitus that they got a tumor. And we can do evaluations on them and find out if, there's, if that's an issue or not. And then counseling the patient about how to deal with the issue uh, is, the, is where I spend most of my time. So there's methods for us to evaluate it, to suppress it, to identify it, and to describe it. There's no magic solution, medically or surgically. Yeah, there is. On aver they advertise on TV for this supplement that takes care of it. <laughs> Well, I encourage you to buy as much as you can. <laughs> I take it there are no controlled trials that show that that's of anything. Amazingly enough, there are no controlled <laughs> trials that show its oh, efficacy. Okay. There is nothing that has been demonstrated to be to get rid of tinnitus. There's a lot of people that spend a lot of money trying to seek a solution. There, are a, there is a small por portion of the population where tinnitus becomes all life encompassing. It can drive you nuts. There are certain levels of tinnitus that will drive you nuts. Famous uh, actor William Shatner was on a Star Trek set and had a blast and caused tinnitus, and it drove him nuts. He really had a very, very difficult time and sought all kinds of solutions. And he said he considered suicide. Mm -hmm. Many people do commit suicide because of ringing your ears. Because you can't get away from it. You had a perfectly quiet life. You could lay in bed and hear your wife snore. Now all you hear is this ringing in your ears. And it will keep you awake. Dr. Can you take this new, that Lyrica device, and can you have it filter out the sound in tinnitus so that people don't hear it? Here's the amazing thing is that when you... With tinnitus, if you provide some competition to the signal, it suppresses your attention to it. It's like having a, I, dis, I give this description to my patients. If you're sitting in a perfectly dark room and you light a candle, that candle's really bright. And wherever you look in the room, you can see the light of the candle. And if you look at the candle light, it's quite bright. You turn the lights on, the candle hasn't gotten any less bright. 
it now has some competition. You don't even notice the light of the candle. In fact, if you even look at the candle, it doesn't look that bright. Same thing with tinnitus. When you provide some sound competition to the tinnitus, it suppresses your brain's attention to the, to the signal. And so we do a lot of work with people that are, that are bothered by the tinnitus to suppress their attention to it, either through masking agents, ear level worn devices, or something as simple as a noise machine on their bedstand at night to provide a, a, a signal. I tell my patients, turn on a fan in your bedroom, and that should that that will make a difference. Does it stay at the same frequency with tinnitus, or does it change frequency as the sound that's perceived? Fractal noises are the most efficient at dealing with suppressing tinnitus. So a music a der derivation of a musical tone can suppress it. Does not have to be the exact same frequency. It can be an off frequency, um, and different formants will help provide some, some masking ability to it. But does the tinnitus remain at the same frequency in these patients, or does it vary the over tinnitus time? remains at the same frequency. Um, I can see a patient one day and, and measure the frequency, and they say, it's really bugging the hell out of me today, and I'll measure it. I haven't come back in a month. They say, well, it's still there, but it's not as bad. It's exactly the same. Same frequency, same perceptual loudness level but the brain's attention to it has changed and so they're not as irritated by it. But if they're tired or they're fatigued or they're stressed out, if it's have a kid in college, their tinnitus becomes more bothersome. So it can come and go as far as irritation factor goes. So once the tinnitus is basically in your brain, even if you destroy the cochlea, they still hear it. Yeah. People got in, the people, uh, they get tinnitus, find out they have a severe schwannoma. Going for the surgery, they sever the, the nerve leading on upstairs and the tinnitus remains. It burns itself in the hard drive memory upstairs. And so it's really tough to get rid of. Can your screening test for acoustic neuroma eliminate the need for MRIs if you're you know, really thinking about it? Depends on whether you play the lottery or not. I don't play the lottery because I don't like my odds. Many of the tests that we do can eliminate the, can reduce the, the chance that you're going to have a vestibular schwannoma. MRI is going to guarantee that, but the tests that we do reduce the likelihood significantly. But so does that mean they're going to go on to the MRI anyway? Is the, well, that's my question. Depends on what your out-of-pocket expense is yeah. and whether you decide to do that. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have an MRI. And vestibular schwannoma is a very, very slow growing process, and you're going to see a change in auditory function. You're going to see some other changes before you see a big change in the, in the size of the tumor. So. And what's the difference between a vestibular schwannoma and an acoustic neuroma? Or it's exactly it the same the thing. The same word? It's okay. really, it re really rises out of the vestibular cells, so it's, it's actually it's better. It is a vestibular schwannoma. And then um, how often, do, if you get, have one on one side, will you get another one on the other side, an acoustic aroma? It's, you're very unlucky if that happens. If you have neurofibromatosis, that's an opportunity. But other than that, it's pretty uncommon. Very, very, very uncommon. And then how often should people get MRIs to follow their acoustic neuromas? <laughs> you're asking an audiologist a uh, audiology <laughs> question? <laughs> I would say depending on your insurance benefit, but every couple of years. Okay, so my dad has an acoustic neuroma, and uh, I think he gets his MRIs like every six months. And they told him the reason that he has to have it done is because they're worried about the other side. That's, I, I firmly believe he's misinterpreting their recommendations because that is, that's crazy talk. Well, that's why I'm asking. <laughs> Okay, well, very good. Who has an interest in that MRI facility? Yeah. You know, he's, a, he's back in Nebraska. I don't know. Well, there you go. I don't know. That's what you get for living in Nebraska. <laughs> we all get a, a transient buzzing in our ear from time to time. Like yep. Two or three seconds of tin. I assume we all do. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> what, 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 is what is that? That actually is a hair cell saying goodbye. Oh, dying? Yeah. So say goodbye. Oh. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a simple explanation, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's typically hair cell death, most commonly. And it happens, 
It happens to everybody. How many do we have to start? 30,000. So if it happens 20,000 times, you're in trouble. <laughs> so here's the stats on, uh, on tinnitus. Uh, I see a lot of patients for this. The good news is, is that, um, that talking to patients about it uh, makes all the difference. But if you tell a patient it's never going to go away, just get used to it, learn to live with it, you're really a bad doctor. <clears throat> That's the worst possible thing you can ever tell a patient. I never tell a patient that. I tell a patient that in a different way, and it makes all the difference. You would not believe how many patients I see all the time that come in looking for a solution, and a physician has told them, There's n you, you gotta learn to live with it. Well, how do you learn to live with this? And it just actually makes the tinnitus worse. Because now they're focusing on it. They're thinking, oh my God, i got to live with this forever. And, and, and that's not the case. All right, so. So, um, so I had a hearing, hearing test done, and because it was bilateral, high, high frequency, sensory neural hearing loss, they said that rules out, or it helps to rule out an acoustic neuroma. How often would you need to do the hearing evaluation or the audio evaluation to be comfortable with that? I, or I don't know that I would ever say that that rules out the opportunity for vestibular schwannoma. Mm -hmm. um, unilateral tinnitus is probably the number one thing that's going to, or an asymmetric hearing loss is the classic uh, feature. But you can end up with, with a vestibular schwannoma and have no auditory impact at all. What may happen is that you slowly over time, your balance changes a bit, which leads into my next conversation. But you become less and less, your balance changes. Dr. If you're doing if you're doing a tinnitus evaluation, is a PET scan sensitive enough to see what part of the auditory cortex is responding to that signal? Yeah, and actually, that's where a lot of the research has allowed us to understand why, where tinnitus occurs within the brain. You can actually see it in functional PET scanning. You actually that, see the uh, stimulated areas. So, if the neuro neurosurgeons were good enough with functional ablation, could you technically take out the sensitive? auditory cortex where you're responding to the tinnitus and correct it? Well, there's, there's, a, there's a couple of, of hot areas where it, where, it, where it shows up. So you're, there's some allegation that gamma knife work has been successful with patients. Uh, the research is not there yet. Well, I've been blathering on and on here. Okay, <laughs> dizziness and balance. This is, occupies a lot of my day. <clears throat> Luckily, mostly with adults that can talk, sometimes talk too much about the complaint. But it's a very, really common problem. How many people have had any kind of vertigo at all in their life at this point? It is no fun. I'm very lucky. I've had the opportunity to share my patient's experience. I have hearing loss, I have tinnitus, and I also had a uh, vestibular neuronitis that knocked me out for a long period of time. Um, <clears throat> I could not walk for a week. My wife had to drive me to the office so I could see dizzy patients. <laughs> um, and I see dizzy patients and said, oh, you got nothing to complain about. And some of the tests I do, I couldn't look at because it made me worse. But uh, it's, it's quite a fun. I always say I'm glad I did not become a urologist. <laughs> so, dizziness is a very, very, very common thing and a very common reason to become admitted to the hospital, spend a lot of money looking for something that's not there, looking for an acoustic neuroma or a stroke. Um, a lot of money is spent ruling that out when in fact there are some very simple tests that can be done in the ER and hopefully in the near future those tests will be available so that they can save all the other diagnostic tests. There's a very neat test that we now have they can identify, is this a vestibular issue or is it a uh, um, cortical issue? Okay, real quickly, we maintain our balance through input from three different systems. What our eyes tell our brain, what our body tells our brain, and what our vestibular system tells our brain. How many, dot, how many black dots are on that screen? <laughs> Oh, Our eyes don't always tell us the true story. There are no black dots on that screen. 
Our eyes are looking for a fixation point all the time. We're, we're looking for depth of field so that we can adjust our position to our space. And I'll move that off the screen. <laughs> Proprioception, the muscle skeletal system, tells our brain about where our torso is relative to our body, relative to our feet. And we're constantly making adjustments on our body position to tell our brain about our body place. The vestibular system, the brain believes over both the visual and proprioceptive system. The vestibular system is made up of five sensors, ten together. They work in concert. There are three semicircular canals full of fluid. At the end of each canal is a little gate. I'm making a very simple description of a complex process. When we turn our head from side to side, fluid swings those gates back and forth and sends a signal to move our eyes. When our head is in motion, our eyes are controlled by our ears. So no matter which way we turn our head, our vestibular system is moving our eyes. And that allows our, our world to remain in focus and stable. If we did not have that, when we turned our head, the world would be lagging us. Our eyes are not active enough on their own to maintain a stable visual image when our head is in motion. So the vestibular system provides that information, the semicircular canals. And they're oriented in three different planes to give us three different planes of movement. The otolith organ I describe as two catcher's mitts, one oriented uh, laterally and one oriented vertically. Embedded in the catcher's mitt are some electrical switches. On top of that catcher's mitt is a bed of jello. On top of the bed of jello are some rocks, some calcite crystals, calcium carbonate crystals. When we move fore and aft and side to side and up and down, those rocks impinge upon the jello, which triggers electrical switches to fire that tell our brain the plane that our head is moving and how fast our head is moving in that plane. And that, amazingly enough, adjusts our neck muscles to organize our head over our body. So it maintains our center of gravity. So the vestibular system comprises both angular acceleration measures, angular measures, directional measures of angle and acceleration. And they all work beautifully until they don't. They become, <clears throat> they can get damaged in all kinds of different ways. So it controls everything we do. And, and how do we measure this? As audiologists, we have a great armor, armory of, of techniques to evaluate balance. There's a test called uh, posturography. We, we put a patient in a harness. We clip them in so they don't hurt us when they fall. And they stand on a platform that moves fore and aft and back and forth. The walls move, and we measure their strategies the patient's employing to maintain their stability. And we can see if they have a vestibular deficit, a visual deficit, or a proprioceptive deficit, or a combo plate of problems. And we can measure functionally what they're doing, a dynamic measure of balance. Video nystagmography, we put on some infrared video goggles on the patient's eyes and, and they can't see a thing. We do certain tests, we have them track things with their eyes displayed on the wall to see if their eyes are doing what they should be doing. It's a central processing measure. We have them lay in different positions and take a look at what their eyes are doing when their head's in different positions. We also torture them gently by putting warm and cool air into their ears and changing the thickness of the fluid within the lateral canal, which causes a signal to be sent to the brain to move the eyes. And we measure what the eyes do after stimulating with warm air in the ear. And we judge one ear compared to the other and see if they're working symmetrically. <clears throat> we do a new test, which is really a cool thing called video head impulse testing. We put on an infrared video goggle, a high-speed video camera now with great technology, computer processing ability, and an accelerometer. We move the head and, and track what the eye does in response to the head movement. If you have a hitch in the giddy up, your eyes are gonna be, a, are gonna be late to your head movement. And we can identify which canal of those six canals is misfiring or giving bad data. If this technology was available in the ER, it would save millions of dollars every year. Because the person comes in, they, they wake up, they're at home, they're sitting around, the world starts spinning around, they can't get off the merry-go-round, they call the, the paramedics, they get transported to the hospital, they're spinning, they're sick, they're vomiting. Folks in the ER think, well, oh, do they have a stroke or not? Well, let's, let's do some tests. Let's do, a, let's do an ECG, let's get an MRI, let's get a CT. 
if they just grabbed them and moved their heads and took a look what their eyes are doing, they'd be able to identify this is a vestibular problem, go home, go see an audiologist, they'll evaluate you and then they'll send you to PT for a fix. Instead, they run them through all these tests, they send them home with, with uh, lorazepam and meclizine and say, it'll get better sooner or later, and it doesn't, and it takes a long time to get better. We also do a test called vestibular evoked myogenic potential. We take a look at what the sacule and the utricle will do on those little uh, gelatinous uh, sensors, and we identify where the problem is there. So we use all these tests to identify where the problem is and where the problem is not. 30% of the patients I see are post-dizziness uh, effect. They have this chronic fear that it's going to come back again. So they're, they're subjectively dizzy. So they have this anxiety about being dizzy, and then they are dizzy. So 30% of the patients I see have an anxiety-related balance problem. It can be fixed. Interestingly enough, another 30% of the patients I see <clears throat> have rocks loose in their head. Those little otoconia break loose, they land against the, the, the cupula, and it tells the brain the wrong thing, and it moves their eyes, and they get dizzy. So every time you look up, you get dizzy. Every time you look under the cabinet, you get dizzy. Every time you lay down in bed, you get dizzy. That's easy to fix. I can fix them in my office with a laying on of hands. Do a special head movement, clears up the, the rocks, and they're and they're cured that day. Some people wait two to three years before and never lay down flat in bed because they can't, they get dizzy. It's easy to fix. Another portion have a thing called a vestibular migraine. Instead of having a headache or having a, an aura, they get dizzy. And that's somewhat easy to identify. So we see all kinds of patients, infants to adults, to evaluate the hearing, evaluate their balance, and then send them off to either get improved or to be cured. What do you need to know when you see a patient? If a patient comes in complaining of a sudden loss of hearing in one ear, send them to an audiologist that day. Many patients come in complaining to their physicians, and it may be you, it may be their primary care doc, it may be a walk-in doc, and they say, I, my, my ear's plugged up, I can't hear. They look in the ear, they think they see something, they prescribe them an antibiotic, and they send them away. When in fact, they have an, a, an inflammatory problem that needs to be treated right away, or things are, or things are gone. They end up with a permanent hearing loss. If they're identified right away, they may be put on a, a steroidal regimen that, that reduces the inflammation, improves the hearing, at least gives them a chance of getting better. So if a patient complains of a sudden loss of hearing, you should send them to see an audiologist that day and make sure that they get in. If they, someone says, well, we can't see them until Tuesday, call somebody else. Your nose throat guy is not appropriate? Ear, nose, and throat guy is going to say we're going to we're going to have an audiologist do an evaluation. Okay, so Typically, there's a there's an audiologist as a colleague within their practice, but not always. Uh, Are there special physical therapists that use ears? Because most of the physical therapists don't have any ear experience, it seems like. Yeah, there are physical therapists that are vestibular specialists or vestibular rehabilitation specialists that we refer our patients to for care. So not every PT has that ability or interest. So we get that name from you. Or the see, they see you and you tell them what to see. Okay. Yeah. So sudden hearing loss is a big deal. We, I see it all the time, but I usually see it 8 to 12 weeks after the fact, and then we can do nothing for the patients. So that's a huge thing that you can do to help your patients. We had a patient just yesterday. So that's, that's a big thing. If you look in an ear, you see some, some amber hue to the, to the TM. Not that big a deal. If it's, been, if it's been that way for quite a while and the child's speech and language is delayed, that's probably a big deal that ought to be taken care of. All right, I've rambled on and on here. Questions I can answer. Are there any drugs that are good for vertigo? I haven't seen them. Before. Yeah, there is one that's very good for vertigo. It's called scotch. <laughs> no. Uh, there's, there are vestibulosuppressants. Um, 
Meclizine, amazingly enough, is a very bad medication to give a dizzy patient, but sometimes it's what they have to have because they're absolutely miserable. The less you use meclizine, the better. It's a neurosuppressant. It suppresses the, the response. And what you need to do is to get the, the, the brain to recognize the error, to correct for that, for that error, and it'll get better quicker. If they're medicated, they're going to take forever to get better. So the less medication a patient is on for a vestibular problem, the sooner they're going to get better. You know, for men years that have been using diuretics for years, is it worth it? it does it do anything? You couldn't know it. <laughs> yeah. So you said there was one drug, but then you said meclizine's not it. What no, is scotch. It? Got it. Oh. <laughs> scotch, I forgot. All right, well, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And there's some of the things, there's some of the things we torture patients with here. Oh, <laughs> and most importantly, my office is over early. I'm hoping you guys over. Thank you very much. I know we have the research conference. I haven't sent you any zoomies lately, so that's, a, that's always a good thing, and I'm not sending you any crazy people. So. Uh, well, we're, we're actually going to, uh, I'll be in clinic with Drew on Sunday. Oh, wow, that's, that's, that's a good thing. Yeah, I guarantee.